On this episode of This Week in Space, we're talking about NASA's Artemis Accords and the country of Ecuador with Robert Alion. Stay with us. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Zscaler, the leader in cloud security. Cyber attackers are using AI in creative ways to compromise users and breach organizations. In a security landscape where you must fight AI with AI, the best AI protection comes from having the best data. Zscaler has extended its zero trust architecture with powerful AI engines that are trained and tuned by 500 trillion daily signals. You can learn more about Zscaler Zero Trust plus AI to prevent ransomware and AI attacks. Experience your world secured. Visit zscaler.com slash zero trust AI. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 104, recorded on March 29th, 2024. The Artemis Accords, Ecuador, and you. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Delete Me. Have you ever searched for your name online and didn't like how much of your personal information was available? I know I have. Delete Me helps reduce risk from identity theft, credit card fraud, robocalls, cybersecurity threats, harassment, and unwanted communications overall. Now, when I did search for myself online, I found a lot of stuff that I thought was okay because I've written a lot of books and so forth, but I also found a lot of information that I wasn't happy about. And if you don't like that, Delete Me is something you ought to look into because it works great. The first step is to sign up and submit some basic personal information for removal. Then Delete Me experts will find or remove your personal information from hundreds of data brokers, helping reduce your online footprint and keeping you and your family safe. Delete Me will continue to scan and remove your personal information regularly. I hear from them from time to time with stuff that really makes me feel better and safer online. And this includes addresses, photos, emails, information on relatives, phone numbers, social media, property values, and more. Since privacy exposures and incidents affect individuals differently, their privacy advisors ensure that their customers have the support they need when they need it. Protect yourself and reclaim your privacy by going to joindeleteme.com slash twit and using code twit. That's joindeleteme.com slash twit and code TWIT for 20% off. Hello and welcome to This Week in Space, the importance of being Artemis edition. I am, of course, Rod Pyle, editor-in-chief of Van Astor Magazine. I'm here, as always, with Tarek Malik, editor-in-chief of Space.com. Hello, Tarek. Hello, Rod. Hello. Happy what, so, Happy spring now? We're in spring officially? Let's just call it Happy Friday <laughs> because we're being joi- happy, made happier by the fact that we're being joined today by Robert Alion, the founder of Leviathan Space Industries and a prime mover in Ecuador's signing of the Artemis Accords. Hello, Robert. Hello. Rod, nice to meet you. And uh, Tariq, it's awesome being in, in the show. So thank you so much to, for inviting me here. Now it's good to see you again. It's been three weeks, two weeks since I last saw you. Three weeks, right? Something like that. It's definitely. It, so it, we definitely want more of you guys to learn about space coming to Ecuador. <laughs> yeah, which was which was a great time. And I, I can't thank you enough for that. But before we start, I need to remind everybody to make sure to do us a solid, make sure to like, subscribe, and so forth with our podcast so we can stay as incredibly popular as we are. And uh, do consider, please, joining Club Twit. As you know from listening to Leo's show, times have not been easy for podcasters, and we can really use the support. And heck, for seven bucks a month, you're not going to find anything better anywhere, except maybe dinner in in Ecuador. Um, Now, the most important part of our pre-commercial bit is a space joke from a loyal listener known only as Chris. Are you ready, Tarek? I'm ready. I'm ready. Chris, what do you got? Tarek, why does Jupiter always seem to be in dire financial straits? I don't know. Why? Because he's frequently saying, I know I owe. (laughs) Oh! (laughs) One had to think about that one for a minute, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Yeah. I owe owe not getting a lot of space joke love, so it's nice to see the most volcanic place in the... uh, uh, in the solar system, uh, getting a nod every now and then. And, and it's not a joke, and I think I mentioned it before, but I remember back in, let's see, when did they reconnoiter Io? Early 80s, right? 
uh, with uh, well, well, Voyager. 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 Yeah, Voyager. yeah, with Voyager. Yeah, yeah. When in Voyager fact, was... a, U- a USC student turned researcher was uh, on the team that discovered the volcanoes for the first time. Uh, well, it's good to know at least yeah. at least one person from USC was successful. Oh my gosh! Um, <laughs> uh, but I remember at the time. I remember at the time the uh, press was up at JPL, and one of them was referring to the moon as nine as ten. Oh, oh no! They, they didn't oh, realize no. it was I and zero. They thought, or I and O. They thought it was one and zero. All oh, right, change your font. So <laughs> often as it was, well, that wasn't me. I was, I was just uh, in attendance. So let's get to some headlines, shall yes, we? Yes, yes. Busy week. So busy for, week. Yeah, and boy, oh boy, right down my alley from Reuters, Boeing sues Virgin Galactic. Yeah, really. Not on my bingo card list this this week. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, but the, yeah, this, this actually happened. Uh, actually, the twenty second. So the news broke last late last week before our uh, our episode. Um, then, but yeah, Boeing is suing Virgin Galactic over um, a dispute revolving their plans for a new mothership uh, for their suborbital space plane uh, 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 fleet. You know, as you know, Virgin Galactic is kind of scaling up. Their new fleet, the Delta class of the Spaceship Two vehicles, which can uh, you know be easier to fly, faster to turn around, and they want because they're going to have more of these vehicles, another uh, mothership like the White Knight Two uh, right. uh, carrier plane that will be able to kind of go up, you know, get get, get these craft to, to altitude, drop them, let them launch, and, and whatnot. And White Knight Two, just like the Spaceship Twos, need maintenance. You know, they're, they're, the turnaround time isn't as fast as what Virgin Galactic wants. So they want this second uh, generation carrier plane to to do all of that, be able to fly more often, uh, fly with with, with less uh, maintenance and, and be more reliable. And to do that, they tapped Aurora Flight Sciences. That's a subsidiary of, of Boeing, as I understand it. Um, and they've been working uh, behind the scenes to kind of develop the plans for all of this. Well, apparently that relationship uh, soured dramatically uh, because at the end of, of the, the contract or whatnot, uh, Boeing is is saying that uh, uh, that Virgin Galactic owes uh, Aurora Flight Sciences something like twenty five million in unpaid fees for work done on this uh, design, uh, as well as uh, that Virgin Galactic uh, they allege that they they kept some trade secrets. And as I understand it, it's like some design type uh, expertise and some equations used for the vehicles themselves. Uh, some really kind of high tech stuff. Uh, and they're supposed to destroy all of that. And and. Uh, Aurora Flight Sciences is worried that, you know, if, since they haven't destroyed it, they can just take it and build their own mothership instead of working with Boeing and, and the company on that uh, or go to another company and say, hey, we got all this stuff here. Why don't you build it for us now? So uh, a very kind of uh, a convoluted yet uh, I think it's going to be a case to watch because depending on the outcome, we'll find out where or when they're going to get this other uh, carrier plane because a lot of their business plan will revolve on being able to launch uh, more of these uh, suborbital space planes uh, over and over again, and they need more carrier planes to do it. At least one more. So. Should be noted, I suppose, that White Knight has flown a number of times very successfully with uh, with no adverse effects. White Knight Two, because White Knight One was, of course, the one that was used to carry the smaller Spaceship One, which right. is now in the Smithsonian. So White but, Knight Two is the one that Virgin Galactic is using now currently. My, Eve, my, I think, my is the, the point is that they both worked and. Well, anyway, there's probably something untoward to say about Boeing there, but I will keep it to myself <laughs> because I'm a nice guy and I know you're sensitive to that. All right. Well, and those were built by scaled composites, you know, way back when, and Burt Rutan's cl- Yeah, but uh, using Boeing group. secrets. So. Yeah, well, I guess so, apparently. Apparently. Uh, all right. Next up from uh, Florida today. That's a new yeah. one for us. The Delta Four Heavy. Now, the Delta Four Heavy is a... Uh, what would you call it? A sort of uh, soulful lineage of the Delta rocket, but it really isn't. It's like like the Atlas um, mm-hmm. ULA years ago, completely redesigned both the Delta and the Atlas. But the Delta IV Heavy is three Deltas clustered together. It's very cool. Watching it launch is very neat. And we're waiting for what we think is the final launch of that vehicle, right? That's right. That's right. You know, uh, before the rise of the Falcon Heavy rocket, the Delta IV Heavy was the most powerful rocket in the U.S. operational arsenal uh, at that point in time. And now uh, it is time for the United Launch Alliance, which has been building these uh, rockets for the last um, uh, uh, 
you know, like like a couple couple of decades or, or whatnot to just kind of say goodbye uh, to the, uh, the, the Delta four heavy, uh, heavy lift because they have their new Vulcan rocket, of course. Uh, but it's not just the end of the Delta four. This is the last of the Delta rocket family rotten. Mm. So this is, you know, they, they, they retired the Delta twos, uh, a, a while back. They, they had other, other variants, uh, as well. Um, and in its 64 year history, this is the last one that will ever fly. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of kind of attention uh, for this mission. And of course it's like the most impressive variant, the, the, the triple core uh, first stage, the Delta four heavy. It was, it is launching a spy satellite for the national reconnaissance uh, office. And unfortunately when they tried to launch it uh, yesterday, as we're recording this, uh, they had a, a bit of a plumbing issue uh, on, on, on the rocket and they are not able to launch it uh, today. They had hoped to do, mm. To, to kind of launch it before you and I started recording today. Um, and so they're going to take their time. They say that they need to have, uh, it's an issue with a government supplied pipeline <laughs> that, that, that feeds into the rocket. And, uh, and they're going to wait and get some information from the, the, the government, I guess, supplier uh, to, to decide when it's going to be safe to actually fly the rocket itself. Uh, but if you didn't know, that the, the last of its kind rocket uh, Delta four heavy was going to fly. Now you do. And if it does launch over this weekend, we're hearing maybe April 1st uh, is, is the next possible to attempt. Uh, that's this way. You won't miss it. It's a crazy to watch because when it lifts off all this fire and flame kind of crawls up the side of the, the yeah. triple boosters uh, looks for like a little it's bit. In big trouble. Yeah. yeah it, looks, it looks like it's on fire when it's taking off and then it lifts off and it goes into space and it, it looks to me like uh, Princess Leia's ship in um, the, the in the in the in Star Wars uh, uh, A New Hope. So uh, I forget the name of that ship, but anyway, it's that one. So that cruiser. So uh, I'm having trouble picturing that, but okay, I, I guess the I one that she's that. on that Darth Vader in. Yeah, that, no, I like, understand what ship you mean. I just don't see the <laughs> resemblance. I always look more like. Well, I won't say what it looked like to me. Um, <laughs> oh, the other thing about the Delta Heavy was, I believe, besides being the most powerful for its time up until. Well, up until SLS, I think. No, Falcon no, Heavy. No, no, Falcon Heavy. Powerful. Falcon yeah. Heavy. Yeah. So up until Falcon Heavy, it was also the most expensive launcher you could buy, right? Yeah. Yeah. I believe it was something like four hundred and fifty million. That's yeah. a lot. Yeah. One engine weighs fourteen thousand eight hundred and seventy six pounds and is seventeen feet tall, according to Florida Today. So pretty crazy stuff. Because newspapers love those kind of stats. All right. And let us uh roll to the next and last one. We have an eclipse coming up. That's right. And we would like you to go to space.com for a number of reasons to learn all about it. But perhaps most importantly, Rod's semi-annual warning about be very careful when you buy your eclipse glasses because there's a lot of forgeries out there. Yeah, this one comes from our reviewer, Alex uh, Cox, and uh, uh, and the American Association, uh, the American Astronomical uh, um, uh, Association, because they want everyone to be aware that you know, despite the excitement of the solar eclipse, which again, to everyone, there's a total solar eclipse. It's going to go uh, from Mexico through uh, Maine and Canada on April 8th in the afternoon. So it's going to be uh, like really noticeable. Most of North America uh, will have some kind of an eclipse, partial or otherwise, uh, during that time. But for uh, everyone, you know, you can't stare directly at the sun. You need uh, solar eclipse glasses, but they have to be verified and safe to use. And unfortunately, as we saw in 2017, during the last great American uh, solar eclipse, there's um, a lot of fraud going out there where people will just stick this um, ISO certification, an international standard that, that tells you that the the filter on the glasses themselves is rated to filter out most of the sunlight. They're just putting that, that, that on there and the, the filters themselves aren't. So we have a, an article uh, by Alex that really kind of touches all of the advice and, um, and checkpoints uh, from the, the AAS uh, to like help you kind of check if your glasses are safe. So this is like a reminder. If you've bought some glasses or you're waiting for them, one, one way to, to check is uh, put them on inside the house and look at like your brightest lights and you shouldn't really see anything. You shouldn't anything. see, yeah. yeah, you shouldn't see pictures on the wall. You shouldn't see like the, 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 anything around your, your office, maybe the brightest spotlight, like in your house, you could, it could look dim, but you really shouldn't see much at all. If that checks out, you can go outside and start looking around again. You shouldn't see anything uh, through the, the, the glasses themselves, except, uh, you know, a dim, uh, dimmed light from from the sun itself. So if it passes that inside test first, and that's really important, uh, then you can go outside and, and check. But you want to be sure 
that they're safe before you go look at the sun and you don't want to suffer any kind of eye or retina damage because uh, you can really injure yourself. And of course, another reminder, never use binoculars or telescopes oh, or anything no. uh, with, with, uh, when observing the sun unless you have an approved uh, filter made you know, or approved by the manufacturer himself. I actually bought a Celestron telescope with a Celestron filter uh, that I can put on top of it and some uh, Celestron solar binoculars that are have the filter built in uh, so we don't have to worry about it and we can observe the sun uh, safely. And I know that they're safe because I trust the Celestron brand. I've been using their telescopes for years. Uh, and, and that's kind of how I have the peace of mind for myself there. But this is like a reminder because we're going to talk about the eclipse, I think, in our next episode. Um, that if you've, if you've ordered equipment, make sure that it's safe. Um, don't just take the, the certification that's printed on it for granted if they're paper uh, uh, glasses. Make sure you d just do a, a quick double check from these guidelines from the AAS. And and we'll talk more about this next week, but just very quickly, because some people may be thinking, oh, crud, I need to order those glasses I've been putting off. Yes, you can go on Amazon. Uh, the majority of the stuff there is a little sketchy. If that says approved by NASA, it ain't, because yeah. NASA isn't in the business of approving sunglasses or sun eclipse viewing glasses. And most of the ones I saw said approved by NASA. So that's bad juju. What you want to look for is Celestron, if you can get them in time. Lund, L-U-N-D, is a manufacturer of both little cardboard glasses and ones that look like conventional sunglasses and solar binoculars, as Celestron also makes. And I'm told, I think it's Astronomy Magazine, it might be Sky and Telescope, but I think it's Astronomy Magazine, if you can find that on the news rack, they have shrink wrap glasses with the magazine this month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an expensive way to get your solar glasses. But well, people, you a lot of a lot of libraries, schools, uh, uh, public public, they're 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 having well, giveaways. But another trusted company is American Paper Optics. They're the primary mm -hmm. supplier. Okay, in uh in in the U.S. and uh for, for these, so a lot of these companies, uh, Astronomy Magazine, etc., they're getting them. Uh, through special order because they make yeah. branded ones. They made them for space.com uh, uh, when we had ours uh, way back when. So but I, I think it's important for, for parents, especially, Yes, you know, if you do get glasses from a library, check them out because those guys aren't necessarily in the business of knowing how to do solar astronomy. And yeah. I won't go into my whole song and dance, but my eyes were moderately damaged by doing solar astronomy as a kid with an inadequate filter. You don't want to have cataracts when you're 45. So be careful, be safe, be smart. And uh, last thing I'll say is if you've got kids, don't let them stare at the sun for a particularly long time. These things are meant to be used for 20, 30 seconds at a time, not 10 minutes. All right. Got anything else, T, or can, can we no, move on? No, just, just what we're going to talk about the eclipse all next week. So I don't want to. Uh, next. Episode, yeah, let's so get wanna... to the good stuff. <laughs> all right. Speak of the good stuff. We have an ad coming up, so hold on to your seats and go nowhere because the best part is just about to come. Stay with us. So, Robert, very good to have you here. And uh, I, I, once again, will just say I can't tell you how much I enjoyed my time in Ecuador. It was a fantastic trip. And no, I didn't just bring him here because he brought me to Ecuador. I brought him here because he has a lot of really interesting things to say. So before we hear your interesting things to say... Um, can you kind of introduce yourself? Uh, because your life didn't start off with rockets in space. It started off, well, at least as an adult in finance and banking, which is not always the usual route to get into this, although increasingly it probably will be as we figure out ways to make money there. But how did you get into space? Well, thank you, Ron. And that's a, that's a great question. Uh, my interest started back in an early age, thinking about, you know, the economic challenges that a country like Ecuador, a third world nation faces and what it's needed for economic development so we can escape our problems. Um, so that led me to study economics, political science and develop a career in banking. Um, afterwards, when I decided to make the transition, I was looking at to see how can we use technologies to definitely help solve, solve these big problems that we're facing? And because the big question is competitiveness, you know, how do we make an economy competitive and what technology can we do it? And we saw that space definitely had like the biggest impact that it touched every aspect of the local economy. So we, that's where we said, if space is the next big thing, how can we play a role and what can Ecuador offer? in space to be part of that. And its geographic location was pretty unique to see what type of space activities we can do. And, and that's the reason that we decided to, uh, to start with Leviathan Space to start thinking about if commercial 
companies are going to be looking to expand and grow. They're going to be looking for new alternatives. And that's where we think that a private spaceport can definitely be something to create value in a complex supply uh, space supply chain. And, and that's how we started uh, back in 2018. And we've been working towards uh, advancing that and thinking about how do we make a whole ecosystem that can definitely create value that way. So, uh, yeah, and I want to talk more about the spaceport in a few minutes. Um, but the other thing that's remarkable about, well, there's a lot of things that's remarkable about you, but you, you started a National Space Society chapter in Ecuador, in a city called Guayaquil. And, you know, most people who start a National Space Society chapter, you know, they get together, they have dinner, they chit chat, they, they page through Ad Astra. They're enthusiasts, but in Ecuador, the National Space Society chapter has become something, because of you, largely, of a force of nature and actually uh, creating change. But l let's talk about how the chapter started and some of your activities, if you would. So we were very excited about the National Space Society as an organization. We participated in the ISDC, the conference that they have every year back in 2019. Uh, we presented a paper on a a very exciting topic, space taxes. <laughs> so so it, it was definitely about this uh, thought provoking process uh, of, of thinking about how property rights and taxes should work in space to, to help grow the, the space economy. And, but I definitely saw that there was a community and we definitely wanted to, to have uh, the young kids in Ecuador, a place where they can relate, where, where they can find their own community and where they can get involved and where we can also advocate, you know, for, for space in Ecuador. And so that's what we're looking to create in our city, the city of Guayaquil, uh, this group. And so we were able to have a voice for everybody. And in our first meeting, which was great, we were able to have over a hundred people show up trying to see how they could get involved. And even the United States Consul General uh, was able to give some opening remarks and talk about space. So he gave a little weight about uh, the importance of space and, and all the things that we could be part of. And, and, and I think that's an important part of, uh, of this conversation is making people think that they can get involved and they can contribute. Well, yeah. So I did want to follow up, Robert, because you, you had mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the, the inspiration <laughs> or the, or the impetus of, of Ecuador and space, uh, there in that, uh, that discussion. But uh, of course on June uh, of 2023, I think it was the June 21st, like the first day of summer, that's when NASA announced that Ecuador had become an official signatory for its Artemis Accords. And I'm wondering what that path is like. Is that like a tough sell uh, to to the folks in Ecuador to say, hey, you can get involved in this and here's what you could do? Or um, had it been going on for, you know, uh, years in the background uh, to get to that point where, um, where this official agreement, you know, uh, really crystallizes uh, to expand on Ecuador's role, not just in space, but in lunar exploration, you know, with NASA's program to go to the moon. So as we were engaging, uh, the Ecuadorian government talk about space and uh, the use of a spaceport and what other activities we could do. Artemis was uh, uh, where we thought a low hanging fruit, fruit, something that we could definitely be involved in and create a lot of value by, by becoming part of. So we had been in talks with the government by 18 months before June 21st. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to get the support from Professor Greg Autry from Thunderbird School of Global Management. Also, Mike Gold from Redwire was also very instrumental in helping us and providing advice. So we had to engage the Ministry of Foreign Relations, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Transportation, all government agencies. And we had started first doing some webinars. You know, having the conversation about space law, you know, and, and treaties and, 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 and what are the opportunities for that? After that, we were able to transition uh, where we had one of the top uh, environmental leaders and opinion leaders in Ecuador, Ines Manzano, write a very important article, uh, opinion piece uh, regarding Artemis and what that meant. So, so now we were in a major newspaper talking about the subject. After that, we had to continue, you know, that level of engagement uh, with the government officials and they had to validate, make sure what it means regarding a treaty, a bilateral treaty with the U.S. And, and we had to also explain all this process about what, what space, what was happening in space because people were we're, we're not familiar with that. So, so that level of advocacy took some, definitely some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to get a lot of support, like uh, different universities in Ecuador in being advocates also for the process. Lots of different companies in the U.S. We were able to get letters of support 
towards the Ecuadorian government, telling them that space was important and that Artemis should definitely be a path to follow. So, so that level of support from uh, the local community, the international community, and then I would say the excitement of uh, the Department of State, the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Consulate in Ecuador, you know, about what it meant in amplifying a bilateral relation, uh, we definitely saw lots of doors opening towards uh, what Artemis can mean. So when we had the final pitch to the Minister of, uh, of Foreign Relations, uh, it, it was exciting because mm -hmm. we had everything already, you know, signed by everybody, reviewed by the legal department, all the other ministers were okay with it. So it was just the final decision to see if we do, we do the sign or no sign type of type of event. <laughs> deal or no deal. Exactly. So 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 we had a, a an important lunch uh, with him at uh, Universidad San Francisco de Quito. And uh, we had all the you know university officials, you know, our our allies and friends there. And we were just pitching to him, you know, th this is the moment, you know, we can yeah. definitely be, be doing something with space. And, and, and one of our allies, Roque Sevilla, who was able to coordinate the meeting was, was also present. Uh, and uh, other members, Nelson Gim, had been instrumental in supporting uh, all the local efforts for, for this to happen. And, and then, you know, he said, okay, let, let's sign, you know, <laughs> after, uh, after, after such an intense drill dur during lunch, he was like, if there's no objections, I don't, I don't see a reason why not. And that, and that was like, the case that we we're trying to make, you know, it's a no risk situation. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's all positive, you know, about all the things that can happen if we, if we follow this path. So he took a very valiant risk, I would say, because public opinion at the time was like, you know, we have better things to worry than space. You know, we have other priorities, political situation, you know, that Ecuador was going through. Maybe space was not something that was high on the agenda. But the good thing was that we were able to do such a good work to have everything ready that he only had to say, let's do it and, and let's sign. So he said, OK, let's sign. Let's figure out uh you know, sometime in the next couple of months to, to do something about it. And then I was saying, well, you're going next week to Washington because you have an <laughs> agenda already. How about if we just sign it there, you know, next week? So he was like, well, do I have the time in the agenda? So, so I definitely we pushed him there and he <laughs> acquiesced. And, and then he, we were able to talk to NASA and the State Department, you know, and they said, okay, great, let's have a meeting. And we were able to, to have the ceremony at the Ecuador embassy in DC. And he was, wonderful because at the same time there was a, a delegation from ecuador businessmen there from the american chamber of commerce and uh, we had the minister of foreign relations we had the prime minister uh the, the minister of uh, production and ambassador yvonne Baki, uh who was playing a huge role in being our our big supporter in space driving this topic so so when you see the picture you see you know the top leadership from ecuador being there with nasa and the state department so so that was a very very powerful thing that we were able to achieve yeah we've got a photo of that on john on line 34 there at that at that link that's the uh the official photo from from the signing it's interesting that you mention we have we, we have other things that are priorities you know when you're discussing because that is like the perennial uh uh discussion or debate over whether anyone should invest in space science or space exploration. It's that we've got others. So we've got potholes in the street, on the ground, well, you know. Uh, and, and let me just add, we've been hearing that in the U.S. since about 1964. Yeah. Those yeah. arguments are going on right down to protests taking uh, taking place outside the, the gates of the Marshall Space Flight Center and, and other NASA facilities. So that question never goes go. away. So Yeah, there's the they, picture. Yeah, There's that photo. Did you get to keep a pen, uh, Robert? From the signing well, is that <laughs> well let, let me tell you that something before the event i went to the nasa headquarters office in dc and they have a nasa store yeah, so i was able shop, to yeah. they, the gift shop so i was able to get uh six different pins so i took <laughs> so that said artemis so i took them to the event and just laid them on the table so they can be like you know like uh blessed by by this event. right right <laughs> can you just breathe on each of them be enough. <laughs> and we were able to give them to all the folks that really work hard to make this happen. So, so it, it was great that, that, that our top friends and allies were able to get afterwards. They were not there in person for, for the ceremony, but at least they were able to keep the momentum. So, so mm -hmm. with, with, now, with that. I, I have to make a point here, Tarek, because you and I, 
you more than me, but we both are constantly chasing our tails because of our workload and so forth. And I know Robert's a very busy guy too. He's got a young child. You know, there's a lot of things going on in your life, Robert. But what impressed me so much about watching you operate is that level of planning. So thinking ahead, because I would have been there with a broken pencil and, uh, you know, an Etch-A-Sketch or something saying, uh, I forgot to bring the pens, but here, sign this thing anyway. <laughs> and you thought ahead and got enough pens that everybody, you know, had a memento, which of course, you know, it's a small thing to take advantage of at the moment, seemingly, but in two months, the president's going to pull that pen out of his pocket and think, oh yeah, that was kind of fun. That's a cool thing. I had to call that Robert guy and nominate him to be the first Ecuador's first astronaut on the moon or something. <laughs> so, you know, this is very smart. So sorry, Tarek, I know you had a follow-up. I just wanted no, to- Well, I guess the only other in. follow-up, and, and this is something that, that Robert, you mentioned actually a couple of times leading up to our discussion about uh, the Accords, but you, you, you mentioned Ecuador's location. You mentioned the discussions about a possible spaceport. And for uh, a lot of our listeners, they may not like com- link the location of Ecuador with yes. a spaceport. Although, you know, we do know that Europe operates um, out of French Guiana and their, their spaceport there. But what is it about Ecuador's location that, that kind of lends itself to the possibility of a spaceport that would make sense to either uh, uh, in a, you know, like a native space program or uh, to other folks looking uh, for uh, a boost, if you will, to, to get into space uh, uh, based on, on where you are on, on the planet. We definitely think that Ecuador is a magnificent place to do all kinds of different space activities. We definitely have a comparative advantage based on the geographic location due to the speed of the Earth, the rotation. Mm-hmm. That gives an additional boost for rockets to be launched. Uh, As you're, you're, th- you're, you're close to the equator. We are yeah. right on the yeah, equator. Yeah. We're latitude zero. We're mm-hmm. right there. We're the, we're like, the, the, we're the chosen Park people ec- to do a space. <laughs> has the word equator in it. So, yeah. Uh-huh. We're the chosen people to go to space, as we might say. Uh, so we've been blessed by this location. And, and this image here that you see, I don't, I don't know if you can see this background. Mm-hmm. This is the Cotopaxi tracking station, which was a NASA tracking station from the 1950s that was built to support the early satellite communications and the Apollo missions at the time. And, and, and this is, has been working for since, since that time. And, you know, it's like going to a museum. So you have communications, you have launch opportunities. And another exciting aspect is reentry. You know, as you bring things back from space, they can come from the west to east of the Pacific Ocean and they can land on the coast of Ecuador and be recovered. Capsules mm-hmm. and other types of vehicles that could be the case. And then we start thinking about Ecuador is such a small country, you know, but at the same time, it's so geographically diverse that people can come here and train to become an astronaut because they have lots of different challenges. They can climb volcanoes, go to the jungle, scuba diving, lava tubes in the Galapagos Islands. And it's also an amazing place to do science. You know, it's such a rich ecosystem here. Thousands of plants, thousands of varieties per square kilometer that that happen here. So if you want to replicate those ecosystems abroad, you know, Ecuador is a place to learn about how do we create life in Mars, the moon and beyond. So so it's just the perfect test bed, I think, for 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 doing space activities. And, and hopefully we can create that so more people can come here and operate. So it's, it's interesting you mentioned the the lava tubes because while I was doing my my brief tour through the Galapagos, I did get to go through a couple of lava tubes as every tourist does, I suppose. But I was thinking, you know, if if I had to go somewhere to simulate living in a lot of lava tube for I don't know a week or however long we do these these sims, you know, these analogs, that would be a great place to do it. Um, because the whole point is not to go outside anyway, right? So it doesn't have to be in Hawaii or something. Um, We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. So, uh, Robert, I think this this can happen anywhere that you've got a conversation going about space, but especially in a smaller country, a smaller market like Ecuador, you know, here's here's the big government buildings on this on the Civic Square, and here's this guy from the National Space Society coming and saying, and I know you have, you know, other other notations on your record besides the NSS, but that's one of them coming and saying, Hey, we really ought to get involved in this big space effort. And uh, you already kind of touched on this, but besides the natural hesitation or the head scratching, is there also a bit of a giggle factor with people 
not necessarily at the highest levels, but but anywhere because you know we we get that even at ISDC. Somebody will bring up yes. the, at our conference, our annual conference. Somebody will bring up something particularly outside the norm. Most people there would go, "Oh, it's an interesting idea," but some people go, "What? Really? You think you're going to live on Saturn's rings?" So um, has that been an issue for you guys? I would say definitely. Uh, many years ago, there were some. Uh, attempts to be able to launch some satellites and uh, be able to do some uh, work in space with an agency that was created by the government. But that was a failure and the public opinion turned against them because it was very politicized, a lot of questioning about possible corruption and the program did not go anywhere. So people, just like you said, Rod, you know, when they yeah. thought of space, they thought about those first efforts and the negative things that they brought to them. So we definitely had to spend a lot of time, you know, educating people about the changes, you know, that this is definitely not a political effort just to gain popularity, but, you know, about what the impact means, you know, about in education, bringing innovation to companies, see how the local industry can benefit from this technology, you know, having a, a wider view about uh, the benefits of space. And, and that has been a, a challenging conversation, of course. And that's all around the world. But in Ecuador, we had the case that where the space agency was dissolved like four or five right. years ago because right. people were not uh, thinking that it was important. So part of that advocacy work has after Artemis has been about thinking about let's have a national space strategy. You know, let's start thinking about what type of policies and regulations do we need so we can be successful in creating the right environment that people will think that space is a viable business and that we can participate and contribute to the international community. And what are the necessary treaties that Ecuador needs to have to become that partner uh, to the United States and the rest of the world? So there are things like the missile technology control regime that definitely regulates uh, the exports of sensitive technology. And that's a great way for Ecuador to show leadership that it is serious, you know, about mm. uh, the, the use of ballistic missiles and also the technology safeguard agreement, which in this case allows top U.S. technology to be able to come to places like Ecuador to be able to be launched or used in the future. So those are strong statements for Ecuador to follow uh, as we decide to become uh, competent in, in space. And Artemis, the, the important thing is that it just opens up the door. We were able to tell the international community that Ecuador is serious about space and we would definitely want to become a partner. And we, now we have to find what do we offer and how do we contribute thinking about the collaboration. Uh, yeah, that kind of led into my next question. But before I, I go there, um, you know, we as I mentioned, we have this conversation in the U.S. constantly about why space, why space, why space. And some of this in the trade keep saying, well, because, for instance, for every dollar put in the Apollo program, we got back between 16 and 25 dollars on our investments and education and uh, STEM careers. And, and, you know, the beat goes on. So I imagine that you have similar conversations. But it, again, it's it's a market that you're in that's a little less familiar with that story. So I imagine that that that's kind of a uh, can be a tough one. And, and part of it, I suppose, I mean, you know, there's this two sided blade on one side. So we've got 36 international 35 international partners now signed on to the accords last I checked um, with Ecuador being number 26. So on one side, what I is think NASA? It's, it's, I think it's 36 now with Uruguay, uh, Rod. Oh, so you seven. did add. OK, yeah. Thank you for that correction. Sorry, sorry. Mr. But, Mr. but Mr. 35, God, exactly. if Rod also includes, you know, the United States as a primary and 35 partners. So there we go. How yeah. you view it. <laughs> so, you know, the U.S. gets something out of this, which is building this coalition to show the world, hey, we're truly international. Yes. We're including everybody. Come along for the ride and so forth. Um, and then what does Ecuador get out of it? And by that, I mean both immediately and in the long term, because there's there's different levels of this. And, and I think that's the million dollar question, Rod. And, and I think that, that the first thing is that we have a seat at the table and mm. a phrase that in Ecuador is used a lot is that we're not late to the party because Ecuador usually is for all these international events, international communities, international treaties. We wait to see what the neighbors in the region are doing before we decide to act. And by that time, all the decisions have been made and 
all the policy has been shaped and all the benefits has been reaped by the other participants. And we're just the last ones to, to join in. At least now we were able to sign before India, before Germany, before Holland, you know, establish space countries, you know. So, so it was great for us to start thinking about it, you know, that we are we're pioneers in the first 26 countries to be able to, to be part of Artemis. And that opens up doors. So now there's interest of other organizations to find ways to collaborate with Ecuador, like the Space Foundation, uh, the Milo Space Science Institute from Arizona State University, where they want to develop programs for K through 12 and also for university students, thinking about workforce development, where Ecuador can be the pilot for their Latin American efforts. So, so that's great. That's great news for the young students, great news for what the future can bring about having this group of kids, you know, that are motivated by science and technology and then how can they apply it because one of the biggest challenges that we have right now if you're from if you've seen probably the news is that ecuador is at risk because of the drug deals that are happening it's being used as a transit point for all these drugs cocaine coming from colombia peru to go to europe and the united states and that affects the local communities it affects the kids because they're being involved not only as participants in these activities but also as consumers so we definitely think that space can be a very motivating factor to create these local heroes that focus on the knowledge on the learning on the science to be able to provide a different path for the kids to follow so so i think the space can be a very big tool for for us to find a way for these terrible uh happenings and you mentioned, Robert, you know, the, the dissolution of the Ecuador Space Agency, but the need for uh, a national uh, space strategy and, and, you know, certainly signing the accords can, can perhaps inspire local universities and whatnot to come up with ideas in which to participate. Do you see any early signs then? I, I mean, it's only been less than a year of, of that kind of, um, that kind of interest taking shape. And the, the reason I ask is because what we saw during the, the first uh, Artemis one launch was not just like NASA launch an Orion capsule to the moon, but they launched like a bunch of, uh, of CubeSats built by companies and universities out to go test, uh, different things. And just this year alone, as we're recording this, there've been at least three attempts at moon landings, a couple of them from private that included lots of yes. different uh, experiments uh, and components from different universities from a wide range of countries. And it seems like there is a bit more of a, a realistic opportunity for any kind of experiment, you know, no matter what, if it's from Ecuador or from a different a country or a school to have that path now. And that being a signatory would kind of get you um, like a heads up of when those opportunities come up. So is like the preparation, are you seeing folks saying, you know, we, we should be, be ready to have ideas when the call goes out for them. One of the main things that I think are so cool about Artemis is that it will make all the data from the discoveries available for all the participants. And, and that's really groundbreaking about having all these open source information for all the schools and universities to benefit. So, so, so we've been telling the, the schools to be ready for that. And, and for that, we need to have the teachers and the students prepared to be able to deal with this new influx of information that will be coming from Artemis. So we see universities like uh, University of San Francisco de Quito, which is one of the leading institutions here, just had their own space day a whole day event dedicated towards talking about space and see how they can be involved because they're doing already research with NASA regarding weather at the equator. But now we have opportunities to start thinking about biomedicine, what that means for environmental protection, the use of satellite images. Now they've applied and they are, were able to get the host of the NASA Space Up Challenge for Ecuador. So it's going to be great. So now those opportunities open up about how they can be, become involved. We have other universities like Espoo University, who just did a hackathon this week with Arizona State University Interplanetary Initiative regarding the use of satellite data uh, for monitoring the oceans. So, so, so now they're taking steps. They're getting ready and the students are rising up to the challenge. We have have schools like Colegio Javier from Guayaquil that have sent seats to the International Space Station. Just imagine, you know, how space is so affordable that now that a school can send a project of science to the International Space Station over a year to stay over there. And 
it opens up doors for thinking about sending seats, uh, uh, sending postcards to space. Organizations like Club for the Future, you know, open up the door for that collaboration. And we had 10 schools from Ecuador participate and send over 4,000 postcards where, their own, where the kids send their own private, you know, drawing or poem or essay to space. Before 30 years ago, that was impossible. But now even small countries like Ecuador can become involved in some part. And, and for me, it's about breaking those mental barriers, you know, for the young children to think, you know, that things are not ac accessible, you know, and that your role is just being in Ecuador and just being in your community. And there's nothing outside of that. Now, imagine if the hardest thing that they've done when they were 12 was be able to go to send something to space. When these kids are 25 and 30, they're going to be fearless. There's going to be no limits to what they can do because they've already been to space. <laughs> So one of the cool things that happened while I was down there, we were talking to the American counselor staff down in Guayaquil, and they were discussing, and it was a bit, a bit of a, a tangential from from the reason we were there, but they were discussing uh, the founding of a community college system in your country, which uh, I guess will fill a, a really critical niche between simpler technical schools and the elite universities. Um, do you see both your efforts in terms of developing a spaceport, but also uh, signing the Artemis Accords as affecting and perhaps informing those programs? What, what's important is that it opens up the doors to start thinking about where we can contribute and create value. And for example, the U.S. college system, it's a low cost way of getting more people to school and be able to learn so that they can try it, test it, and then decide to go toward other types of careers, you know, as, as they go uh, towards engineering or, or business or, or, or other types of careers. Another technical aspect is trade schools. And, and I think that's something where Ecuador can definitely be benefited by, by having uh, this level of access uh, to participate and see what we can offer the United States. The United States will need to grow and they, you know, and will need talent from all over the world to be able to continue its growth in space. You know, we have ITA regulations that places a lot of difficulties, you know, in attracting the talent right. for non-U.S. persons. But, you know, the United States will need to flex in, 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 in a couple of years and, and decide that they definitely need to expand its uh, production base and, and have uh, people be able to work. So that's something, a conversation that will need to come out, uh, I would I'll say, rather soon. Just imagine a world where in the next years we'll have companies sending 400 or more rockets a year compared to the 200 almost that we have last year. You mm -hmm. know, So for that type of cadence, for that type of production levels, you definitely need to improve that industrial base and have the welders and the technicians as well as the aerospace engineers and, and on, on all the people to be able to support that. And we we'll start thinking about what, other countries can do, you know, even though the United States is saying, let's focus on the onshoring process and focus on our industry locally, you definitely benefit by having uh, access to talent pools and knowledge and resources from around the world. And especially in America can definitely contribute and be a part of, of, of that value to the United States about thinking about what can we do in the supply chain for assembly, what we can do in the supply for satellites, what we can do for chip components, you know? So, so those are great questions to start seeing, you know, how do we become ready for that future? What can we do now to be able to embrace and say, United States, there's 3000 engineers here ready to help, you know, where can we help your new missions going to the moon, Mars and beyond, or what can we do in this case to support other private business activities that are definitely looking to create value. All right, and I have one more question pertinent to that, which I'll ask as soon as we get back from this break. Stand by. All right, um, it, pursue it to what you were just talking about. One of the things you had mentioned to me about the uh, spaceport is that it would not just be a launch facility, of course, but a larger business park with, with international partners. So um, how do you envision that rolling out? Uh, who would be participating and what do you need to make that happen? What do we need to make that happen? So in this case, the important part now will be thinking about the regulatory process and the international treaties that are needed. Uh, we had mentioned the 
MTCR, the Missile Technology Control Regime, the mm -hmm. Technology Safeguard Agreement. Those are the first points to to be able to be ready for that future where, you know, U.S. technology can definitely flow and, and find that Ecuador is a secure place to, to do those, those type of operations. The FAA standards for the launch licenses and the space for launch are very important. And the FAA has shown great leadership in providing those level of international standards. It's thinking about aviation, and now transition into space where the international community are following and learning from all these big lessons that the FAA has gone through. So one of the things that, that we're working on is uh, with the Ministry of Transportation is how do we work towards adopting those standards and, and be able to be able to work with them? Because we've already done it with aviation. So there's a precedent. Now we have to adapt for what's coming next. And the role that a space for can play, it's, it's very interesting because it can definitely be many things. And it had flexibility about thinking about suborbital launches, vertical, you know, just thinking about the communication aspect, thinking about the education aspect, a center of learning, a center of production manufacturing, you know, and the same space tourism, you know, people that want to go to space need to train before they go. And it's exciting because people want to go through these life changing experiences to go to space, but as soon as they go to space, the first thing that they do is they turn back and they watch the earth. And that's the thing that really shakes them and moves them, you know, and they come back to this planet with this enlightenment and, and thinking about how do we protect it? You know, how do we care for the planet and, and, and the people? And, and Ecuador shows so much potential for that. Uh, my dream in this case would be that in the next 50, 100 years, Ecuador is the last thing on people's minds as they leave the planet and the first things on their mind as they come back to Mother Earth. So those are great things about thinking about what role we want to play with, with the spaceport. Uh, and definitely the level of international support and community is very important. We are members of the Global Spaceport Alliance, which is an association of spaceports worldwide. And we have collaborated with Corgan, which is a, a design company, an architecture company, thinking about what the spaceport should look like, what role it should play, how do it helps and interacts with the community? How do we create value to people that are thinking of working there in the future? So those are important questions to see what level of economic impact because Ecuador is such a diverse location that we definitely have to worry about what it means, you know, for the flora and the fauna in, in the region and how do we protect it? Well, Robert, it sounds like there's a lot of opportunity for uh, that, that, that you're describing, you know, in Ecuador, both with the, the spaceport and, and a possible business park. Uh, and then just for the youth overall, for a new generation of scientists, of engineers, uh, of folks that would support that sort of industry, uh, in, in, in the country. And you mentioned something that, that caught my interest earlier or caught my eye, pardon me, um, uh, with the students that, that like launched postcards with club for the future. Of course, that's a blue origins, uh, education outreach uh, program. When they launched new shepherd, they, they let folks send in uh, postcards and then they launch them and send them back. Um, but it's an example of how the, that path or that connection to space is much shorter now than it may have been 10 years ago, 20 years ago yes. or whatnot. And, and I'm wondering if you see uh, Ecuador's role in, in the Artemis Accords, Ecuador's interest in a new and local space industry as an opportunity to find those, those new shorter pathways. I mean, I think we've, we've saw, we've seen many astronauts from different countries reach uh, orbit now with, companies like SpaceX and, and Axiom Space um, on a much quicker time frame than might have been, you know, might have thought possible. Is that something that uh, is even being discussed now uh, for the country or is it something that could be possible in the years to come, uh, you know, as as more of the infrastructure stands up, uh, more of the support uh, on the um, the processes back, you know, in the government and in in, in the intellectual uh, university side uh, picks up uh, to uh, to have that 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 more direct uh, access, if it's you know getting experiments to space quicker with the students or 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 not, uh, I'm just curious how that may have changed uh, your thoughts on just the feasibility of getting into space quickly now um, than perhaps like 10, 10, 20 years ago. 
I, I definitely agree with that statement because, you know, having all this infrastructure and having private actors be able to offer those as services really allows countries like Ecuador to be able to participate immediately and not have to wait until developing their whole local capabilities. So, for example, now we're able to select and reach a company and say, we want to send something to the space station. That will take within six months to be able to find a, a slot, to be able to send the experiment. And within a year, we'll have it back. Beforehand, we'll have to think about the whole process of building a rocket, designing everything from the ground up. It will be so expensive that nothing will get done. But but now we can just go ahead and hire it. And thinking about the astronauts, it also opens up opportunities for, for people, for the military, you know, the Air Force that want to have astronaut training to start thinking, okay, we can have commercial opportunities to train that are very affordable. You know, like the Virgin Galactic, you know, is over around $300,000 per person, maybe a little bit more by now, but you also have Blue Origin and, and the tickets prices are going down there. So that's something that people can definitely try to find a way to participate. And we've been offered those opportunities. And now we have to find, try and figure out is how do we fund them so we can have the first female astronaut from Ecuador to go to space? Or how do we get the first person from the Air Force to go to space? So, so those are opportunities that are there. And now we just have to figure out how do we make sense of that and how we can fund it correctly uh, from the private sector in this case. And if we, if we can get it with government support, it will be great. But I think definitely, you know, the private sector can definitely uh, do some of the heavy lifting and find ways of collaborating, not only within Ecuador, but the international community to be able to achieve those type of missions. So you say private sector, and that kind of gives you a springboard. And, and I, you, you've kind of half answered this question already. But in terms of moving ahead, and when I say this, I mean both for Ecuador and for Leviathan, your company, and the efforts that you're you're attempting. How can you be best served by the U.S. government and by private industry here, which will probably be ultimately one of the bigger bigger investments? I would definitely say that uh, the opportunity for the U.S. government is to show leadership in the region. It's about engaging the rest of Latin America in space and having wider conversations about how do we support within Artemis or a bigger relationship with NASA and participate in. And we can do great things, for example, having the NASA Artemis and the rest of the NASA crew come and train in Ecuador. You know, very simple they come here, they go to the volcano, they go to the lava tubes, you know, as part of their training to go to space, they can spend some time going here. That could be something really exciting that Ecuador can learn and provide. Uh, we can start thinking about there's an international program for uh, for uh, internships that NASA provides. So that can be opened up to more countries in the region, including Ecuador. So those are the type of things that we definitely see that we can collaborate and participate. As NASA starts thinking about how do we grow food in space and how do we feed our astronauts, you know, and the people are going to be working there. You know, countries like Ecuador have a lot of experience in growing food. Uh, we're big agri exporters with shrimp, $7 billion industry, cocoa, bananas, cocoa, coffee, and uh, fresh flowers. So we can be a great part of the diet and the health of those astronauts. So those are great lessons that we can learn and we can contribute. So I definitely think that there's a lot of room to be able to offer those opportunities. And this new hardware and infrastructure that is available now because of the private sector investment in the United States, the Blue Origins, you know, the ULAs, the SpaceX, uh, definitely allows more of that interaction. And I'll tell you a funny story. When we were able to send the first seats from Ecuador to the International Space Station, there are no rules or regulations right now anywhere in the region stating how do you get something to space and coming back to Earth. So when we first approached the Ministry of Agriculture saying we would like to send some seeds to the United States for research in space. They were like, well, there's not a form to fill out here for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, so everything and, and, stops. So, so, so we were saying, well, but we were able to, to get this form signed by APHIS in the United States, the Department of Agriculture, saying that they're okay with the seats going there to fill out this process. And then they were like, well, we do not have a process, but if they're okay with sending the seats, 
we'll, we'll go ahead and, 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 and give the okay for that too, as long as they're okay. So we were able to get that okay. But then we had to go back to them and said, but now we would like to bring the seats back to Ecuador because we finished the mission. And, said, and they were like, why do you want to bring them back? What's the point? And we had to explain the, the point is we want to do science with that. We want to learn things. So it's very interesting as, you know, things get more complex, you know, that the, all the different organizations will need to adapt to space and what that means. If we're going to be sending artificial organs, if we're going to be sending medicine, if we're going to be sending uh, fungi to be studied and things along those lines. You know, everybody needs to be involved and be part of that and, and, and shape that future because there's no rules and regulations for any of this. So it's a no playbook. It's brand new. And I just wanted to, to follow up one real quick thing that you, you mentioned, uh, Robert, because you said, you know, the one of the goals could be the first female Ecuadorian astronaut, and and that's that, that suggests, of course, that there there was a, a first uh, a male astronaut, which I, I believe is is it Ronnie Nader, right, who was trained. No, uh, but we, no. we don't have an astronaut. No, 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 no. Oh, so so you still you're you're looking to to fly somebody. We, we haven't been able to send anybody to space, yeah. and, and we are looking to to support that dream, you know, of Ecuador having that leader in space that is able to 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 reach that. And it would be wonderful to have a, a women leader to be able to to be so representative of everybody. Right. Well, there are a couple of uh, grad students I met at the talk at the second university I was down there that I would 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 heartily recommend for that role as being the first Ecuadorian woman on the moon. Um, Robert, I want to give you the final word for a wrap-up statement. If you have anything you want to tell Ecuadorian youth, the world, U.S. government, Tark, whoever you want to talk to, <laughs> this is it, man. So uh, I would definitely like to add, Rod, that, that, that I hope that is from this podcast, you know, people in the United States and other parts of the world can definitely think that there's opportunity for engagement. And there are countries like Ecuador that can be markets for space. So, you know, it's not only thinking about it U.S. centric view, but is how can we go ahead and engage countries like Ecuador to support your own business plans about selling more products and services, you know, mm -hmm. and, and engaging the local community and creating that impact and, and, and be able to expand the labor base and the knowledge base. So, so, you know, you get, you, the United States is not alone. There's a, a whole world ready to support the efforts in space. And I, and I think that's exciting part of what Artemis can provide. All right. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today for episode 104. That's 104 dazzling episodes of This Week in Space, This Week about the Artemis Accords. Don't forget to check out space.com. Of course, the website to the name and the National Space Society at NSS.org. Both are good places to satisfy your spaceflight cravings and to stay abreast of the International Space Development Conference, which is coming up in just under two months. And it's going to be in Los Angeles this year. Yay, very convenient for me. Um, so if you can make it to that, you should. And we'll be having a guest on to talk about that in the next few weeks. But um, suffice it to say, uh, Robert's been there. I've been there. Tarek's been there. It's a great place to go and and be with your tribe, if you will. Um, Robert, where is the best place for us to stay abreast of what you're doing and what you have accomplished online? Oh, I would love to invite you guys to follow uh, in the X platform uh, at Guayaquil Space. And if you want to learn more about the spaceport efforts at Leviathan underscore space. And that way you can definitely see all the news and definitely would like for all of you guys to come down to space, visit us, you know, reach out to us and we're more than glad to host you and so you can get a little bit more about what Ecuador can offer. It would be great. All right, Tarek, of course, this is the time of the show where I say something nasty about your chair and, and your website and your gaming, but I'll just say, <laughs> where would you like us to go look for you? Well, I mean, uh, you can find me at space.com as always. I am, we're like T minus one week and a couple of days to the solar eclipse. So I've got some packing to do for my road trip uh, up north uh, New York to go check that out. Um, and you can find me on the Twitter at Tariq J. Malik uh, or to keep up with, you know, how those exploits go. However, I would say if you're in New York, do drop by the Intrepid Air and Space Museum, see Air and Space Museum, where they have uh, Apollo when we went to the moon, Rod, right up your mm -hmm. alley, uh, mm -hmm. which is an amazing traveling exhibit from uh, oh, uh, from a NASA center. So it's, it's, it's great to see. And you're right underneath the space shuttle Enterprise. So when Tarek says right up your alley, it's like saying, hey, grandpa. 
here's an exhibit you're going to like. Only because you've what written like when you're a kid. You've written like 30 books about Apollo. That's why I'm mentioning it. Doesn't here. everybody? <laughs> All right. Um, and, and yeah, and, and that's a good point. We'll both be heading off to the eclipse. Uh, I'll be leaving on the 5th myself to go to Austin. And fortunately, we'll both be back in time to pick up the podcast. Uh, before we go, I want to thank, uh, make special thanks to Greg Autry, who introduced me to Robert through his program at, uh, at Thunderbird, and also to the Guayaquil chapter of the National Space Society, who I had a great time meeting while I was down there and got a really great painting from, which is in another room, but it's a picture of me on the moon, which would probably make uh, Tarek and the staff of Twit very happy. You have to show uh, that to us now. So I, I will. It's requir a requirement. Um, please remember to drop us a line at twists at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-S at twit.tv. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and ideas. And we're starting to read uh, favored emails on the air. So um, that's something to look forward to. And if, if I may, I'll just add one real quick before we go. Yeah. This is from Tucker Drake, who has his own podcast. Uh, he says, Rod, as someone who worked for a supplier to Boeing 20 years ago, I know that at one point in time, they really took things seriously. I've also worked for supplier. This is an op-ed piece, by the way. This doesn't represent our opinion necessarily. I've also worked for suppliers to Honda, Toyota, and various gun companies, and none of them were as down into the dirty details as Boeing used to be, which she's casting as a good thing in this case. With all that's been happening with their planes of late, all I can think of when you're talking about Starliner is that scene in Apollo 13 where they tell Jim Lovell's son that there's been a problem with the mission, and he looks up, and I'll add with doe-like eyes, and said, is it the door? So he's, he closes by saying, my hat's off to any astronaut, but if you're climbing into Starliner, that's some next level, level courage. Well, Tucker, I, I hope you're not correct. Um, we've got our fingers crossed for Starliner. I think they've got things uh, worked out this time. They've, they've gone through it with a fine-tooth comb, and there has been a change of leadership at Boeing that will surely ripple down through the, the space division at some point. So fingers crossed for those guys because they, yeah. they are an amazing company that have done amazing things, and uh, I'd like to see that part of them come back. And we'll find out in May. So, you know, fingers crossed for all of that stuff, too. You yeah. that's, when, that's when Starline is supposed to fly. Sonny Williams uh, and, and, and Butch, they are raring to go, I can tell you. So. Uh, I'm sure they've been ready for quite a while. <laughs> uh, new episodes of this podcast publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher. So make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. We'll take whatever kind of review you want to give us as long as it's five of something. Don't forget also that you can get all the great programming with video streams on the twit network ad free on club twit as well as some extras that are only available there like uh well mostly me making fun of Tarek again for just seven dollars a month you've heard leo talk about the tough time facing podcasters and this is your chance to step up and help because we could really use it finally you can follow the twit tech podcast network at twit on twitter and on facebook and twit.tv on instagram thank you very much Tarek. thank you robert thank you everybody else and we'll see you next time